Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of the Linux Lads. As you can tell, I'm not Shane. Um, Shane has a man flu or something, some excuse as to some reason why he's, he's not here. Um, but we will go along with the road. Um, so, as usual, I'm Connor. I'm Mike. And we also have um, Joe Essendon here with, with us. Say hello, Joe. Hello, everyone. Hi, Joe. <laughs> so... Before we get things onto the onto the road, uh, oh, um, Mike, what have you been up to? Uh, well, I've been moving, which is the reason why I wasn't uh, here the last time. I moved from one bit of Dublin to another bit of Dublin, uh, and it was well as moving is one of the most horrifying experiences of my life. Bloody hate to move. I think I might stay here for a while. Hopefully, now. Uh, but hopefully it will improve the quality of my recording because where I've moved to is like a million times more quieter than where I used to live. Well, I've, I've not actually been to your new house, but um, you're certainly in the, the uh, where you were previously, it was kind of close to a main road where kind of buses and everything were going by. So I, I can certainly see from that from that point of view. Are you in a kind of off off a main road in a cul-de-sac or something like that? Or Yeah, more like a block of flats in a in a kind of a compound way around a car park. But basically the main road is on the other side, so I can't hear it. I can't see it. It's peaceful, like in the middle of a forest here. Just wait until your neighbours start drilling and stuff, man. <laughs> <laughs> you mean you mean drilling or drilling? Hammering, drilling, all sorts of stuff, man. Oh, flat living is not conducive to podcasting. Well, yeah, true. But I've always been living in flats, well, most of my time, because uh, I don't like houses. My wife doesn't like houses either. And uh, it's basically cheaper as well. <laughs> yeah, although I had to build a soundproof booth in order to do what I do. I used to have a box from a fridge that I put myself into and I used that for soundproofing. Didn't work very well, but <laughs> nice. Yeah, no no joke. It was it was it was quite funny seeing him on the on the video feed, but um obviously the video feed is not recorded, so you you dear listeners will not be privy to that. But it was it was quite amusing seeing Mike kind of wrapped up in a cardboard box. Was it as amusing as looking at your pants drying on the radio? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sick burn, sick burn. Or as the, the kids say these days, big oof. What do they say, big oof? <laughs> yeah, they actually oh, don't do. Don't get me started on do that. They, do, they say, do they say that on TikTok or TikTok or what? <laughs> oh, God, we're old men. Anyway, um, right, before we get too giddy, um, I will move on to the Zara VP. Uh, VPN code. So we have a, a VPN discount code for you, dear listeners. Um, it's thirty percent off when you pay for three months of Azara VPN, a security-focused VPN provider based in Sweden, where the law does not require them to log traffic, so they don't. Um, they operate servers in Europe and North America. Their servers are owned and not rented, and they're installed on on location by their engineers and running Debian Linux. They provide WireGuard and OpenVPN options. Uh, their client is GPL v2 licensed and available on Linux. Um, they take all the major payment methods, including cryptocurrencies, and they do not ask you to give you your email address. Uh, so use the code LinuxLads when you're ordering and make sure to click the green add code button to get the discount. The code is valid until the 1st of January 2020. Right. So on to the news. So the first bit of news, glimpse. The fork of GIMP has hit 0.1. Um, so they have a, a release that you can download, whether they're calling it a uh, feature ready or stable or anything like that, but it's a feature that, or it is a release that is publicly available and you can download. So have any of you guys been privy to the whole GIMP glimpse, um, fiasco and what are your opinions on it? Well, I I don't know fiasco. I actually kind of like the day for it. I hate the the name GIMP. Hate it with passion. I think that this kind of uh, is it a joke or whatever whatever this kind of attitudes towards like your project like maybe might have been funny twenty years ago, but it does not show a nice face of you know of Linux and open source in general. So. 
I think that uh, if the if the developers of GIMP won't change that, then then uh, Fork is the way forward. And I hope this project will eventually do what uh, LibreOffice did to OpenOffice and basically take over. Because you know I'm not I'm not that much into marketing, but for God's sake, we should call things something unoffensive. You know, it's not like. Uh, we can, you know, what, what's going to be, I basically, yeah, that's what I'm, what I'm saying is, uh, I, I like the effort and I hope they go far. Well, LibreOffice is an interesting example here, right? Because most normal people still use OpenOffice or are still aware of OpenOffice. Even after all these years, it's still got brand power. People know it as the free version of Office. Oh, I'm not paying for Microsoft Office. What's the point? I'll just download OpenOffice. Even though we as Linux users have been using LibreOffice for as long as I can remember at this point. And it, the thing about a brand is it is very um, powerful. And GIMP, although the name is stupid and, um, you know, some people say it's offensive and whatever. I mean, I agree with you that it is a stupid name, but it does have a lot of brand power as the free Photoshop essentially. And I don't think that Glimpse even if it takes off to the point that LibreOffice has, I don't think that it will get that mind share. That, that's a certainly a very valid point. But uh, the, yeah, um, uh, my take on it is, is yeah, GIMP is a stupid name. Um, and maybe the original GIMP project, if they see uh, maybe, a, I'm not saying a mass exodus, but if they see a substantial amount of people going over to the Glimpse project, we'd be users or developers and um, they might say, hold on, maybe there, the, these guys had a point and maybe they could reincorporate the, um, the fork back into, into mainline GIMP and possibly would come up with a compromise. Maybe not call it glimpse, maybe call it something else. Um, so there, in this, that point of view, it probably is, is a very good idea to, to make the fork, to make the, the rebrand. And they, they came up with a new logo, which is, I actually think is a quite an interesting logo. It's quite well designed. Um, but the counter argument to that is, and I've seen it in, in common trends and I not have personal experience of this, but I can see where it's coming from. Let's say if you're in a, a you're in a non-profit or let's say if you're in a primary school, uh, education standpoint, point of view, and you say, Oh, well, well, well we're not going to pay for, um, a Photoshop license. Um, what is this free alternative? Oh, it's called GIMP. Oh, um, yeah, may, um, maybe just, just because of the name, maybe when we won't deploy this as a non-profit or when we won't plo- deploy this when there could be seven or seven or eight year olds using the software or, or something like that. Um, it's, it is kind of a dancing on eggshells um point and uh maybe it's a bit too PC. Some would argue that it is being too PC, but if it all it if it, all it is is just a name change and if if even if that just satisfies the really ultra PC people, I think it's it's worth it. Just just change the name, get on with it and continue on with the 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 point of the project, which is to create something akin to Photoshop, but do it in a free and open source way. Well, I'm PC bro, right? But I don't think, well, I, 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 apart from hating the name, I think that the problem is with the rest of the things as I mean, with, with some uh, coding and some features that the, the developers of game didn't want to, uh, didn't want to add in. And I think that this is more than just the name that they are also making code changes and they want features and they want to uh, rearrange the UI. I think they already started on that. So, uh, I, because I'm not a part of that community that I can only take what I hear through other media about this. And that gave me the opinion that maybe the game developers might have a bit of a reputation for being, uh, not exactly, uh, you know, they don't take everything in. It could have been also that they didn't have the resources, basically, you know, that, uh, they, they may do what with they get and that made that they, that may, they meant that they had to be pretty strict what with they can, what they can do and they couldn't take into like feature requests and, um, other requests. But, uh, maybe the, the fork is not just because of the, of, because people don't not liking the name, but it's also because, uh, 
they may want the project to take a direction that the developers are not willing to take. I think that's a uh, it's a valid, very valid point, but uh, it's probably a good good point to move on to the next um, piece on on the news, which is there has been a vulnerability in uh, Nextcloud. And of course, everything is, is crying these days. So, um, it's been coined next cry, I believe. Um, it essentially, from my understanding of it was, is a PHP vulnerability in Nextcloud. And then the, the hacker or uh, whoever you want, the attacker, um, essentially encrypted people's, um, Nextcloud instances or their their personal data, and then demanded a a small fraction of a Bitcoin, point two or point two five of a Bitcoin, um, which I think is about two hundred dollars these days, is um, in return to opening up. Um, but I believe there has there has been a update, and if you update your Nextcloud instance, you should be able to. Um, uh, uh, so, well, whoa, uh, okay, uh, well. wait. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've, okay, I've actually. Uh, so basically, there was a vulnerability. They announced it in October, and uh, you, it's not just updating your Nextcloud instance. Uh, you have to go into if you have nginx config, you have to change two lines or a few lines in your nginx config as well. Uh, in order to fix that, but because they announced the vulnerability uh, before people did that and the attacker who acted probably after the announcement didn't get very far. Yeah, this is a bit of a storm in a teacup, really. This is just people not patching their shit, basically. If you keep everything up to date, then you're not going to have a problem. And there are only two servers that were compromised with this like ransomware. That's what they say, yeah. Uh, but... I'm just thinking they basically you get this announcement from Nextcloud. It comes as a notification if you let it. And if you are administering, administering servers, you should definitely let Nextcloud send you notifications through your browser. And they very clearly on their blog said these are the lines in your Nginx config that you need to change in order to like protect your system from this vulnerability. And people did that. So yeah, it might be uh, a bit of, uh, too much ado for nothing, really. So, next piece of news is the Tesla Cybertruck. I know it's not really Linux related, even though I think uh, you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the um, the whole um, massive you, uh, infotainment screen in the Tesla is actually running Ubuntu in the background, so it's tangentially Linux related. But this is just fucking cool. Uh, gadget shit, so we're including this in the notes. Um, so the Tesla Cybertruck, um, it, it's, oh, Mike's, uh, notes here says, ugly as fuck, uh, idiotically named, and, uh, a glorified milk float that Mike somehow really wants. Um, my, my take on it is it looks exactly, um, how somebody in, in, 80s sci-fi movie anticipates that uh, the future is going to look look straight out of Robocop from the 80s or possibly um, Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon if anyone has ever played that game it's like it's a retro 80s video game it looks directly from that it's all straight lines no curves um, with massive um, headlights and on the front uh, one big bar of headlights but it's it's very interesting technology they say it's it's Built like a brick shit house. It's like, there, there, there's, there, 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 if you look at the footage, like they, they, they slam into it with a hedge, a sledgehammer, and to try and see, demonstrate how strong the the door is and all all of this stuff. Um, it's it's interesting. Um, and of course, um, Tesla and Elon Musk is apparently the new hotness now. But it is a very interesting thing. So, what do you guys talk on? Well, Joe, you keep saying how you need a new car, I think, on the podcast. Yeah. Uh, so are you buying this one? <laughs> I don't know, man. Like, I think it does look really cool. It looks like something out of Total Recall. Like, it looks like the kind of car that you should be driving around in 2020. <laughs> yes. You know. With, the, with like, uh, police the in, in, uh, designation on it, right? Yeah. Blade Runner, maybe? That kind of, I know yeah. they don't look like, they don't look the same, but that kind of dystopian sci-fi. I need your clothes, your boots, and your cyber talk. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, man. I think that um, all cars should look like this. <laughs> this wacky, futuristic design. <laughs> I mean, it's 
it's like, I don't know, there's five angles on it. Six, if you count the one that, uh, that goes through the middle. So I guess maybe they just, uh, they just need something that's easily manufactured or the designer just say, I've had enough of this. And Elon Musk t- took a ruler and a pencil and started doing something. But I, I kind of love how much I hate it. It's, <laughs> it's so, it's so stupid. It's bizarre. Like you, I would feel. I don't know if I could drive it through like <laughs> through Dublin. I would feel I don't know what I would feel, and I would like to try it because this is it's it looks out. There's the thing. It looks otherworldly. It looks like it's from somewhere else, not from here. You know, like in uh, Battlestar Galactica in the in the remake from early two thousands when they uh, make shots of the planet, they basically use just one car. They use the Citroen uh, uh, DS nineteen because that look that look was looked just different enough to still be a car but uh, look like uh, something from a different planet this is like even more on the nose i think i'd like to try what it feels like driving this kind of uh, idiotic milk float around is you no know, the underlying technology is is very good so we're we're completely and utterly taking the piss out of just the the looks of it so um nothing against the underlying technology um seems to be that it's it's uh, it's it's all progressing towards the electric car future which is something that I very much agree with um one probably my favorite troll that I ever saw of it was in was on reddit and um whatever the latest uh Team or Tomb Raider video game was. Let's say it's it was 2018, just for for the sake of it. And it said Tomb Raider 2018, and it was all high res, beautifully done, and everything. And then Tomb Raider 2019, and it was back to the original Tomb Raider with the <laughs> low polygon count of boobs, like the triangular <laughs> boobs, just to completely take the piss out of the tes- tes- Tesla Cybertruck. Well, I like the way I like one where they said. This is what happened when a back backend developer tries designing front end. Uh, <laughs> I I all the presentation itself was a joke, you know. When the, when he said, "Well, we tried it. We threw we actually threw a kitchen sink on it, and the glass didn't shatter. And then he then he threw a ball at it or something, and he and he smashed the glass. It, uh, the, and then he said, was well, it didn't go through." Yeah, well, <laughs> he didn't try very hard either, did he? Anyway, moving on. So the uh, next bit of news is the uh, the Slimbook Pro X15 is a laptop. They well designed uh, from the screen or the, not the screenshots, the photos that I've seen of it or the renders I've seen of it. Um, really thin bezels and has a a discrete uh, CPU in it. Um, seems to be and it's a Slimbook or Spanish, I believe. Um, yep. Seems to be quite well. Uh, it's relatively oh, reasonably priced. It is about uh, 1200 euro, but they're aiming at things that could cost uh, 1500 euro or two grand. So, um, roughly in the same ballpark. I'm not saying uh, exactly the exact same internals, but I, I think they're trying to, to compete at somewhat the same level as that. I've recently bought, like three, four months ago, the Entrover Kratos, which has got, which is a similar kind of device, not as slick, but is, uh, it has got an, a dedicated graphics card and a 15 inch screen, right? And, uh, that was similar money. I'm not exactly sure about the configuration. I mean, the RAM in it will make a big difference if it's 18, 6, 8, 16 or 32. But uh, like, if this was around back then, uh, it would have been a serious contender because I like the, I like the way that it looks somewhere between the old, you know, if you remember the 15 year, 15, 15 inch MacBooks or 16 inch MacBook, the ones that had optical drive in them about 10, 12 years ago. And, uh, somewhere between that and a modern HP Envy, like, and it's, it's silver for starters. It's not black, which I like in a computer and it's rarely, rarely, rarely seen these days. And, uh, I, I really like the hardware, obviously, uh, we don't have anybody hasn't we haven't seen if if like the keyboard how does it feel we haven't seen how the performance actually how how it's actually performing or anything but i imagine if this lifts to to the expectations so that, that this is going to be some really nice piece of hardware yeah it looks pretty nice it kind of reminds me of uh, an old vio that i had an old sony vio and i've actually got one of those old school uh, macbook pros that you were talking about i've got a 17 inch one it does look a little bit like that as well um 
I've never really had much of a chance to have a hands-on with Slimbook. I think Poppy had one that I had a very, very brief hands-on with. But um, yeah, I wouldn't mind checking them out. I've checked them out uh, like a few months back, and they were like they were doing nice hardware, but it was all without uh, like it was all pretty good, but it had only integrated graphics, and it was more like kind of a XPS thirteen kind of hardware, you know, uh, good for development, uh, portable thing. I think that was where they aimed it. I must say that their advert was rather misjudged, though. Have you seen where they uh, they get an apple and hit it with a baseball bat? It's all a bit just cringy, really. Like, don't try and talk about Apple like that. I don't know. Just just make your thing and make it good. And I don't know. Just I don't like that kind of thing. I have not seen any footage of it, but I saw a still of um, people saying that this is their advert or whatever. I so I didn't. I saw a still of it, so I didn't know if it was a poster or, or if it was from a video. And it was an apple with a penguin in the background. Yeah, well, it's a fella wearing a penguin sort of uh, mask thing. And he's designing a new product on an Ubuntu desktop by the looks of things, which is an apple. Um, and then he puts an apple on the table and then hits it in slow motion with a baseball bat. Well, I mean, they are trying to do with uh, what uh, Apple themselves did in 1984, didn't they? Except they cannot afford to buy the prime time uh, Super Bowl commercial space. Yeah. Um, in other news, the um, System76 will be designing their own laptops. So they have their factory and they've been putting out their um, desktop computers that they have manufactured themselves with their own laser etching and everything like that. So they've been uh, getting a crash course on how to work with materials, bending metal and so on, and laser etching and so on and so forth. Um, and now they're, they're saying that they will be manufacturing their own laptop cases. So um, they'll be no longer relying on the generic Chinese um laptops that they've been using before that I'm sure uh, plenty of others such as uh, Tuxedo computers and Enterware and, and so on and so forth um, they all get from roughly the same supplier uh, or a number of suppliers I'm sure there's more than one um, but obviously they can they can tailor to their own uh, internals so they can pick whichever the processor motherboard and so on and so forth they want but uh, System76 are bringing it all more in-house, which will probably mean that they'll be able to optimize for terminals and things like that with their with their own in-house design. Well, I just like the balls on that company, man. <laughs> you know, in this day and age where everything's consolidated to uh, to China, they are like, uh, you know, or thereabouts, doesn't matter. Uh, they are like, yeah, you know, fuck it. We do it. We do it in the States. And you know what? The laptops that nobody can really make outside of uh, Shenzhen, we'll do them in the States too. And um, I've seen obviously footage of the Thelios. I've never had a hands-on experience with that, with, of, the, of with that Thelio desktops. And I really liked it. Uh, I've heard in Jason Evangelos uh, interview with uh, Carl R- R- Richel or Richel whatever however he in- says it yeah I've, oh, I also listened to that one it's, it was a very good interview yeah I heard that uh it's going to look differently from the Thelio, but it's going to be their unique thing. You know, I, I like, to be honest, I like every company that like put Linux on their computers. As, as I said, I have an Android laptop. I'm a huge fan of Pine64. Uh, I don't have any, any System76 gear because, uh, well, I don't know if you can even get them cheaply without, outside of the US, but I've tried Pop OS, which they make, and, uh, I, I like it, like, whatever, and I like whatever what I've seen, so I've, you know, fair play to them. Yeah, I'm a bit skeptical that they're going to be able to pull this off, but, um, you know, they, they do make these desktops. It is significantly easier to make a desktop than it is to make a laptop. And their first iteration of the desktops was very noisy and they've had to redesign them. Um, so I don't know. I, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, they do have the factory, as you say, and, you know, they, they do have some experienced people making the desktops. But to make that step to laptops, I don't know. And to make them for any sort of affordable price, I think the first run ones are going to be pretty expensive. I mean, they've always been relatively expensive for what you get. But um, I, I don't know. Uh, I think sceptical optimism, maybe. 
Point of clarification, off the top of my head, I believe they do ship internationally, not just within the US, but obviously shipping costs and, and whatnot. So it'll probably be easier to, or easier and cheaper to um, source from a more local supplier, such as Enterware or Tuxedo Computers in Germany, if you're over in, in Europe. Um, but obviously, if you're over in the States, then um, System76 is, is a fairly good option. Uh, so I do believe that System76 will actually ship internationally. Um, but obviously, your your shipping costs will vary. Yeah, I'm, I think, uh, you know, the price, obviously, that's a uh... For example, for me, that that's very important, but I think they have uh, quite a few dedicated uh, customers that will happily pay for that kind of hardware. So in shipping news, or at least in ordering um, <laughs> devices news, um, you could, the Pinebrook Pro has been available for order, and also the Pine phone. Has, is now up for pre-order or their Braveheart edition. So if you're, they say it's, it's relatively like 99% final hardware, the bar some small niggle, niggles that they might get feedback on, but it's pretty much final, final hardware, but they're calling it the Braveheart edition just to let you know that you guys are ordering uh, an early adopter device. Um, there may be slight uh, revisions down the road, um, later on, but since you're, you're brave. You're ordering the Braveheart edition. Yeah, and crucially, it's not going to come with an operating system on it. You're going to have to flash it yourself. Oh, that's fine. Uh, for the people who will for, who will pay it to pay for it for the Braveheart edition uh, are pretty much. I'm pretty sure they are the ones who can do that. Um, I think. Uh, uh, you know, when I said I like the balls on System76, I like the sensibility of Pine64. We've said it a million times on this show, and it, it's been said on all the other shows as well, that they do things uh, reasonably, sensibly. They don't, you know, they don't ask for money uh, years before they deliver something, and uh, they earn, like, they earn trust of people and they they produce stuff for a really reasonable prices surely no one would take money years in advance of delivering something uh, no no that would that would never happen yeah no well because it does happen it's it's actually a sad fact of the market that they they are able to differentiate themselves this way because yeah it shouldn't happen you shouldn't uh, i mean well may actually people play, can do with their money whatever whatever they want really but uh, i'm glad that there's uh, that there's pine 64 and they they do these things sensibly and i I'm not going to buy the Braveheart edition because I've spent so much money on tech this year that I really don't have, uh, don't, uh, you know, don't want to, don't want to spend any more, but I'm going to be getting a pine for it. And I'm hoping I'd be able at least to some extent, ex- uh, you know, uh, replace my Android with, with it because I hate use, using Android, but uh, I need a kind of a phone. So I don't think you're going to be able to replace an Android phone with it realistically because Apart from anything else, the hardware is very low end. It's only $150. I think I paid, uh, I can't remember how many pounds now, but it, it was, um, I think it's going to work out to be roughly 150 by the time I've paid tax and everything for it. Um, so I've, I've ordered one of these, but it's low end hardware. Even running Android, it's going to be pretty sluggish, I think. So I think we need to temper our expectations about what it's going to be like. Um, with you know various post market OS or Ubuntu Touch, but even then, th- those operating systems are relatively limited in terms of the apps. I mean, I need WhatsApp, and therefore I'm not going to be able to do that on the Pine front. I'm, I'm going to play with it and have it as a secondary device, but I just I don't think that it's going to be anyone's like, main phone anytime soon. On that point, I I would agree with you. Um, I mean. Sure, you could have your, your hill and you could die on it and say, no, freedom. I will only have, um, free, um, respecting instant messaging and chat apps and everything like that. But the reality of it is all your non tech savvy friends, uh, and, uh, relatives and extended family and, and, and so on and so forth will be using 
such platforms such as WhatsApp. So it, it's, it might be something that you, you're just going to have to compromise on. There is other things such as increasingly now there's banking applications and they do their multi-factor application or uh, authentication. And, and the only way they do that is through their own application. And that's typically iOS or Android. Having said that, there I, I had a brief Twitter interaction with uh, a UB Ports dev, and they said that uh, I suggested that oh maybe you could do something similar to what um, Sailfish or, or OS are doing with their Android support, and they said oh well the the reason why they're able to do that is because the. Uh, Sony devices that they officially support were originally running Android in the first place. So there is, there is some, um, Android support that they can kind of write in. But obviously these, this Pinephone device was never intended to run, uh, Android from the get go. Um, so they were going to have to do their own, um, solution. And they said they're, they're, trying out a couple of things um, in order to get Android apps application support for those niche cases such as the WhatsApp and your banking applications and so on and so forth. But those would be the deal breakers for me, unfortunately, um, for switching over to any of uh, those devices full time. Uh, irrespective of the of the actual device itself. I mean sure Joe was saying it's low end hardware. Well, I, I'm prepared to make some sacrifices. Obviously, I'm, I'm, I, I know this all can fail, but, uh, I think there's a matrix bridge for WhatsApp. I'm not sure how well it works. And I, I'm well aware of the fact that WhatsApp can quickly change their API and just uh, break everything. And, uh, but I, you know, I switched bank accounts and I did tell the bank that I don't own a, an Android device or not an Apple device so that they send me a physical key to do a two off on. Uh, online. So I kind of still believe that I can, or I can just start carrying cash everywhere like I used to, you know, it's, it's, uh, I wonder how far I am I able to stretch myself to, uh, to get out of the Android ecosystem because, uh, you know, it's, uh, just, I, I don't know. I don't have any love for my Android phone. I think we'll, with that, we'll move on to the next bit of news. So, um, Google Stadia, uh, works on Linux. Um, and a recently announced game, which is, uh, Half-Life Alex. It's not Half-Life 3. Don't worry, internet, <laughs> or you'll have to wait, keep waiting, internet. Um, it's not the, the mystified Half-Life 3, but it is Half-Life VR. Um, is not launching what, uh, with Linux support straight out of the box, but Google Stadia. Um, actually seems to be quite promising from the YouTube video that we will um, link in the show notes. I believe it's from um, Gaming on Linux. It actually seems to be surprisingly fluid. Um, like it, it, They're experimenting uh, with a couple of things um, straight off the bat. One is that it's it's a monthly subscription model for games and also the game streaming through, through your web, web browser, uh, your Chromecast, which is obviously going to be Google and, and so on and so forth. And there is the Google factor of it's Google harvering up all your data. But, um, it does seem to be quite responsive and it was actually surprisingly well done. I was expecting it to be, I don't know. Um, I was expecting it to be worse somehow. Well, uh, my friend and boss, Chris, he has bought this and subscribed to it or whatever. And he posted a screenshot of Red Dead Redemption 2 Ultimate Edition, which is $99.99. So on top of paying for a subscription, you have to buy these games. And for what looks like one of the best ones, you're looking at $100 for fuck's sake. So yeah, I don't think that's going to do too well. And he said that there's two free games total at the moment. So I don't know, man, this, I'm very skeptical of this as usual. And from a video that I saw that was very, um, detailed, it was very in depth. It's, it's good. It's usable, but it's nowhere near the convenience of playing on a local console or PC. And, um, well, not convenience, but the, the quality and the latency and all of that. In some games, the latency is not too bad and not too noticeable, but, I, I don't know. I, the, uh, convenience was the wrong word there because that that's the the thing that it has going for it that it's much quicker to load games and stuff. So I don't know. Maybe it'll take off, but it's Google, isn't it? And they're just gonna shit can it after a couple of years, and then all the money that you've spent on games will just be pissed up the wall. You won't have them. I 
look at it as a interesting and like actually a very good engineering achievement because what they are doing, they are computing what you can do. They are basically, if I understand this correctly, right? The server is playing the game at 60 frames per second and sending you at no, 120 and sending you, sending it to at 60 so that they can pre-compute the moves that you can make. So when you make a move, you, it, it, it will be loaded on your screen so it doesn't stutter. It, you know, the network latency, that's, that's to make up for the network latency. And I think that, you know, yeah, of course it's Google and they have got the resources to, to, to do whatever they want. But I think it's, 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 uh, a great achievement. Uh, what I don't like is that it's Google and, uh, they will take the data and, uh, then as you said, they can just, uh, cancel it in a few years and uh, you know show the show everybody else the finger and uh, as well as that uh, like how is the gameplay on this how is the um, shared gameplay or how, how you know what do you call it when people play together multiplier thing so multiplayer yeah so can you can you can if i buy a game for 100 dollars can I just send, like with Hangouts, can I just send the two of you a link and you can join me playing my game? But Or do you all have to pay $100 for your separate games so that we can play together? I do honestly do not know uh, the answer to that question. But it is a very interesting question. Um, um, it's, it's something that Valve are also considering I mean they they've launched their their own game streaming and to answer to their solution to that problem is that only one of the party needs to own the game and then you can invite your friends and th- let's say you invite three of your friends and you can play a uh, four person uh, a racing game like uh, uh, the first thing that came into my mind was Mario Kart but obviously uh, that's not available on 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 Steam but something like that of of some kind of uh four person racing game and only one one actually has to own it and then the other three people can join it or another one was um GoldenEye 007 but of course that's not available either so um but yeah, you get the idea. Um, so that's that's their solution to that problem. But the Google Stadia solution, I do not know. Well, I just came. I know. I just remembered back to the time when I when I was what ten years old or something. Only one classmate had a computer at home, and uh, three of us would come to his home, and uh, basically we took turns to to play uh, the first Prince of Persia or something, and uh, that was fun. So yeah, if it, if it could facilitate, so. If it could facilitate, uh, like people sharing and using the computer to play together, yeah, I can see, I can see the, I can see the good aspect. So if, if it could basically games, what I'm trying to say, games are expensive and having kids is expensive. There is a potential for this to kind of get people together just because they don't have to buy three games if they could buy one, you know, so that, that this could be like a little bit of a force for good in that regards. It could be, uh, but well, you know, it's Google, so they probably charge double for everything. So we're fortunately joined here on this podcast by Joe Ressington today. So Joe, um, I understand you're the old wise man at the top of the mountain when it comes to Linux. Um, so tell us about your, Linux journey. Um, how did you get started out? Well, I'm definitely not the old wise man. First <laughs> of all, let me just say that. I've only been using it for like 10 or 11 years compared to a lot of the people that I know who've been using it for like 20 plus. So um, how did I get started? I got started because I had a really shit computer is the bottom line. Um, this must have been about 2007, 2008. I had a P4 three gigahertz with like 512 megabytes of RAM, which even then that was shit. Um, and I was trying to produce music on it with reason and stuff like that, trying to make, um, like hip hop beats and dance music and stuff. And, um, I just needed to eke out every little bit of performance uh, out of the machine. And so I discovered a thing called n don't worry, this will get back to Linux. Um, and what Enlight does is it takes a Windows ISO and strips out all of the crap, basically. Well, all, all of the um, security stuff. Well, you can do whatever you like with it. You can add stuff in or take stuff out. And what I was doing with it was stripping out everything that I possibly could in order to get a really slimmed down version of Windows XP um, to run my um, audio applications on. 
But as a result of that, I ended up with a really insecure operating system. It worked really well, but in terms of security and doing any sort of banking or PayPal or anything like that, I thought, hmm, this isn't ideal really. And my brother had been going on at me about this Linux thing. And so I thought, well, I'll give it a go. And I tried out various different versions of Linux and settled on Ubuntu. But then I thought, hmm, this GNOME 2 thing, maybe I could go for something a little bit lighter and then discovered Zubuntu and XFCE. And I thought, yeah, this is good. Obviously, I tried out um, LXDE and Openbox and stuff like that. And uh, I'd use something called Slacks as well, which is like Slackware based with um, the KDE 3 desktop, I think, back then, way back then, or maybe 4. But anyway, so I tried all these different versions of Linux, and some were super light and damn small Linux and tiny core and all that, but they weren't all that useful. And then I tried Ubuntu and stuff and, and just ended up settling on Zubuntu as the kind of the best balance between weight and features. And having used that for 10 plus years now, I've tried countless other distros, but I always come back to it because it just has that right balance for me. Um, immediately, my thoughts are because you like the the XFC interface and you you like um, audio manipulation and audio tools, have you tried out Ubuntu Studio? Yeah, I have done. And there's a lot of really useful tools in there. But ultimately, you can just create that same experience with Zubuntu by just installing the various applications that you want. And, you know, you can install a low latency kernel and everything. You can make your own Ubuntu Studio that is just the tools that you need. What's good about it is that it's all pre-configured and all ready out of the box. But I, I kind of don't need to use that, if you know what I mean. Do you customize your Ubuntu uh, a lot at all or no? I move the panel to the bottom where it belongs and customize that a little bit with my various launchers and stuff. And that's about it, really. I don't bother changing the theme or anything. As long as the theme isn't horrendous, then I don't really care. And so a lot of people would wince when they say I use Greybird. I think that's what it's called, the default one. But I just don't care what things look like. When I used to use Windows, I always used to um, have adjust for best performance. And, um, you know, that makes it look like Windows 98 or whatever. And I just, I don't give a shit as long as it works and you can read things on the screen, then meh, whatever. What's the first thing that you install when you, when you reinstall your Ubuntu? Probably Audacity and Mumble so that I can do my job and talk to my colleagues. Um, and uh, for late night Linux, I, because I haven't automated that yet, I still use Easy Tag to add the uh, the image to the file. Um, what else is there? But yeah, generally speaking, Audacity is what is my go to on any distro really. Because if I can't record in Audacity, then I can't really use the distro. One thing I will say is, yeah, any time that I've tried uh, someone to, the first thing I do is move the panel to the bottom. It's just, <laughs> it's just what I'm used to. And i um, glad to hear that you, you, that was one of the first things you do as well. Like, oh, it's always in the background that Joe is the XFC guy. I mean, I've, I've been listening to various different podcasts and a uh, lot of them kind of joke, oh, Joe and his XFC and everything. So that's kind of been going on in the background of, of my mind has been trying out various distros, distros, um, w some running Cinnamon, some running KDE and then listening to another podcast and oh, the joke of Joe being the XFC guy. And then it kind of, that seed was kind of planted in the back of my mind and once, as soon as the latest XFC release was released, where they ported everything over to GTK, I went, right, fine. It's, it's been a while. It's time for me to check out XFC again. So on this current machine that we're currently recording on, it's, um, Manjaro with their, with their default, which is, um, XFC out of the box and a arch base with XFC, um, and this, this is just snappy so fast. And this is not the latest hardware by any stretch of the imagination. It's, um, it's an AMD APU, uh, the exact, um, uh, model number, uh, escapes me at the moment. Um, but is not the latest and greatest. It's about two or three generations old. It's running a NVIDIA 750 Ti, um, uh, 16 gigs of RAM, um, 
might even be DDR3, do not think it's DDR4. Um, and a 500 gig, um, SSD, which is where the OS is installed. And everything just is instantaneous. It's actually surprising, um, considering that I used to run, um, uh, Cinnamon on, on this computer and I had no complaints about the, the responsiveness of the operating system, but XFC is just another level. Yeah, well, just imagine running it on modern hardware then. <laughs> oh, burn. But, but seriously, like, it's it's good for older hardware, but what makes it good for that makes it amazing on, like, ultra-modern hardware. You know, I'm, um, let, let me see how much RAM I'm using now, shall we? Uh, so, uh, uh, somewhere in the region of, uh, well, I'm using about three-ish uh, and that's with Firefox open, running this Hangout that you made me use, uh, <laughs> Audacity recording, um, file manager open. So you're not doing too much, but um, if you've got really good hardware, then why not get the most out of it? I mean, some people would say, oh, well, it's a waste. Why don't you run something with loads of cool animations and everything? And, you know, I, I always say the one thing that I love more than XFCE is choice. And that's what's great. It's a kind of double-edged sword with Linux, obviously. But I love the fact that some people really love GNOME and some people really love the Plasma desktop and some people really love Openbox or whatever. Some people love tiling window managers. And and that's great. And if you want to tell me what's good about it and I ask, then yeah, fair enough. And if people ask me, what do I use? I, I talk about how good XFCE is and why I love it. But I'm not going to try and force anyone else to use it or shame them for using anything else. And that actually extends to Mac OS or Windows. You know, if you need something else or want to use something else to do your job, then that's fine. And I think that us as a Linux community should, um, when asked, talk about how good it is. But if we're not, then just shut up about it. Has there ever been anything that almost tempted you to switch from XFCE? Um, yeah, screen tearing, basically. So when watching videos and scrolling in web pages, you get screen tearing. Right. I mean, to, was there ever a distribution that almost pulled you towards itself uh, away from XFCE, you know? Um, well, I mean, the Plasma desktop. So you could say K uh, KDE Neon or, um, you know, Kubuntu or, or whatever has, has nearly tempted me because it doesn't seem to have that screen tearing that I talked about. And Manjaro as well has nearly tempted me because I really like the XFC implementation. I like the icon packs and everything. It looks really nice and it is constantly up to date or relatively. It's, it's lagging a little bit behind Arch, but not too much. And, um, having all the latest versions of stuff would be quite nice, but I just really like the stability of Ubuntu. So yeah, I would say Manjaro in terms of other distros and uh, Plasma in terms of other desktops. Since you mentioned Plasma, I just checked my memory usage and uh, I probably have the same amount of stuff running as you do, but I have OBS running on, on the top because, uh, and OBS is taking 2.4 gigabytes and the whole thing is running uh, on uh, just above five gigabytes. So yeah. I think the XFCE is, uh, well, my, my plasma is taking about as much as the XFCE, but it's a different base. So I'm on open user, so that probably changes things. Yeah, I mean, Plasma has become much lighter over the years. Where I think when uh, they switched to 5, it got a little bit lighter and they've really refined it. It's had a lot of releases now and they've refined it with every single one of them and it is in a really good place right now. Just when your 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 guys were bringing up your system resources, I was I was curious, I brought up HTOP and I'm running at about 3.5 gigs. So roughly about the same, maybe slightly more than um, what Joe is running at. Um, have you ever been tempted by the quote-unquote other really lightweight yet feature-rich uh, desktop environment, which is the Mate desktop. Yeah, I mean, I have used it a fair bit and um, I do like it, but it's sort of like not sufficiently different from XFCE to warrant changing, if you know what I mean. It's GTK-based and yeah, they got to GTK3 way before XFCE did, but it, it's not massively different. It's just kind of like a bit different and things are slightly in different places and it just gets a little bit annoying sometimes not knowing exactly how to change things and configure it how I want. Um, and, and so I think that's why I've never made the switch to it. Um, and I, I do think that it is very, very slightly heavier than XFC as well, but I don't really have any numbers to back that up. That's just how it feels in my personal experience. And, um, 
so yeah, I have been very tempted, but I, I think that if I'm going to make a major change in my life, then I may as well go the whole hog and move over to plasma. That's a very good choice. <laughs> you mentioned the community before with choice and stuff, and uh, you being a professional Linux podcaster, you obviously have a lot of insight into the Linux community. And uh, what do you think about it? What do you think the current state of the Linux community is? That's a very good question. I think the Linux community is much like others, but in a way, it's a bit more naive, maybe a bit more sort of naively hopeful and willing to accept a lot of bullshit, basically, whether that is in the form of software that's half finished because it's open source and, ah, well, it'll get better. Um, Or uh, falling for, um, well, just people's bullshit and people taking advantage of them. I'm not going to name any names of of people or companies or whatever, but uh, there have been a lot of examples that I've seen over the years of the Linux community just, I don't know, swallowing bullshit. And I think that it's because you have to be a sort of inherently optimistic person to get into open source and and idealistic maybe um because well it's certainly traditionally i think less so now when there are pragmatic reasons to to do so and on the server of course um you know they they just are way more pragmatic reasons to be using linux and containers and you know all the open source stuff but on the desktop it's you have to be willing to put up with some issues and you know like the clip that Chris always plays of Leo, it's for people who like to mess with computers. You know, <laughs> it's for people who like to tinker, you know. And I, I, th- I think you have to have this inherent optimism in you to do that. And um, and that's why people fall for a lot of bullshit and, and put up with uh, things that people who use other operating systems just wouldn't. I kind of, maybe, I always thought about it as like, you know, when you see a... Uh, when you see a, I don't know, a supporter of a really shitty but local club that that you support and your dad supported and your and his dad supported, you know the kind of unconditional love for something and that that I think it's possible in Linux because it's a you know the Linux being not a commercial product or at least not in the way we consume it or we interact with it doesn't uh it 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 enables this kind of love the same way a football club would or you know insert your favorite pet thing here uh, whereas like or uh, you know the the mac os is a tool and people people about i think people still well, i think people who use mac os you are probably right i think people who use mac os or windows look at things differently but yeah i think uh Linux Linux does encourage this kind of uh, love and idealism. What do you think this means for the future of the community and for, for the future of Linux? Well, much like with all the choice that we have, it's a double-edged sword, right? You have some good aspects of that and some bad. It means that people are inherently optimistic and inherently willing to put up with a few rough edges if that means that a bit further down the road you're going to end up with something that's amazing. Um, but it also leads to a lack of critical thinking with people. They they look at things uh, through this starry-eyed view of the world and, um, you know, sometimes make some decisions that they probably shouldn't. And if they used a bit more critical thinking, um, it's, it's hard. It's it's like a football club is a good analogy there. Like, you, if you really think about it, if you support some local team that's always losing – but you always have it. It's like almost like a religion. You're not going to question whether, well, maybe I should support, um, I don't know, Man City or whoever's winning. I don't know. I don't really keep up with it. <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah, me either. <laughs> the team at Liverpool or whatever, the, the team that's doing well, that if you really thought about it critically, that's what you would do. But then you don't want to because you, you have been brought up to support your local team. And it, I don't know, the analogy, it gets a little bit stretched there, but, um, uh, yeah, I think that ultimately the community is just going to sort of continue as is, really. I think it's it's key, though, to understand that the Linux community is not one thing. The vast, vast majority of Linux users 
are not using it on the desktop. They're SSH'd into a cloud server or whatever. They're using Kubernetes and, um, you know, all the, the server side non GUI stuff. And we as a desktop Linux community are distinct from, or, you know, in, in a sort of Venn diagram or whatever, we are of a tiny proportion of the people who are actually using Linux. While you guys were talking, just reminded me of when you were saying that, um, Joe, you were saying that the, the people who are using their, 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 maybe they're willing to defend it a bit more because it's a, it's a choice. It's an uh, idealistic choice uh, or ideological choice that they've made. And they say, oh, yeah, it, it may be, um, this piece of open source software may be, may be not as well, uh, polished as, as something that, uh, a proprietary piece of software that may actually run on Linux itself, but it's the very fact that, oh yeah, I have must stick with open source. Open source is the way. And that just reminded me of the, the flip side of it. I mean, uh, it, there's always going to be those users, no matter uh, what platform they're running on. I mean, it reminded me, um, a rather, a rather humorous, um, scene in the IT crowd of, uh, when, um, Jen, I believe this character's name, um, came over with a uh, with a tech question and then completely unrelated to the tech question and then um there was all sorts of icons and everything and viruses and everything were popping up in the background and she's, oh she says oh just ignore all those the, the, um and it's like ignore like the the dancing lady that's in the background or whatever and she goes oh no no that's just the way i like it and like <laughs> that's the way you like it but yeah that but the, it's a rather yeah humor scene and oh no if company speaking from somebody's done um desktop support over the phone and uh, remoting into people's computers those users very much do exist it, but it shows you that they're willing up to put up with so much stuff that they're sometimes their their computer could slow down so much, but they just like oh, that's all that's all fine. But I just w- want to be able to uh, do this one thing and then not be ignorant of the fact that their computer is slow because of all these other things that are running in the background. But to the point of people will put up with a lot of 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 things in order to use the computer the way that they want it. Yeah, I think there's definitely an element in it. Uh, but uh, I kind of like the idealism of uh, Linux, not the not the nasty one, not the, like, uh, oh, we all have to use free software or we would shoot those who won't, the kind of thing I don't like. But I like when, when Joe said, like, that people are, or uh, as you said now, the people are really... Um, allowing or even apologize, uh, being apologetic over a lot of crap. I think it enables a lot of people to start making things that otherwise wouldn't be made because if we only accepted the best of the best, then we would just have the one thing because nobody would be ever able to contest it. You know, people, when you start doing something, you start from shit. You start, you start when you are crap at things and then you, as you do, you get better. And I think Linux and the community, the desktop Linux community, I to tell you know, the wider open source development community because this kind of little thing took off like wildfire. I think we foster it, we, we kind of foster it better than, than a closed source community or where, where the status quo is the cheapest thing. So it never gets contested here because we have, we put enthusiasm into the equa- equation, equation and, and other things. Things happen that otherwise wouldn't. Well, yeah, like I said, there's good aspects and bad aspects. And, you know, I'm still using Linux. And I think that, yeah, we, it is, probably ultimately good but it's not you know 100 percent good we, we have to accept that there are some downsides to this mindset that we have does it ever get you down you know because you as i said you 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 deal with this uh that's your nine to five i assume actually i don't know but i assume that dealing with the community is a huge chunk of your job so does it ever get you down that you think like oh, screw it i'm just gonna i don't know become an accountant or something <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, it does get me down, um, uh, but it, it's more like just seeing people take advantage of the community that gets me down uh, because trolls and stuff are just easy to block or ignore. But it's when people uh, are naively sucked in by stuff that I can see are just obviously scams or whatever. 
uh, and yet I can't really talk about it because it's not really a good look to talk about specific people or whatever within the community that are doing this stuff. And that gets me down that, I, you know, I talk about it privately with my mates or whatever, but I just can't really say anything publicly. And this, this is about as close as I can come and just to talk about it in general terms. What kind of lifts you up when, uh, you know, in terms of community, what is the, well, what happened recently that you thought, oh, this is really good in terms of Linux community? I think any time we get together, really, in person, because we, we are kind of all remote from each other. I mean, we're doing this show remotely, um, and I kind of know you guys, but to, to actually get together and, you know, have some drinks or whatever, that's what lifts me up, knowing that there's loads of really cool people who I get to hang out with occasionally. And and when we do that, um, you know, Foss Talk Live is amazing, like getting to all the podcasters together and oh, yeah. having a drink and everything. I, I love doing that. So Linux lads, um, Fox Talk Live 2020 then. Yeah, but you've got to do a bit more fucking preparation this time, lads. <laughs> yes, sorry. Yeah. I, I, we apologize. No, we sincerely apologize about uh, that. I mean, we are <laughs> uh, we, we are hobbyists to your to to, uh, but we are well-meaning and enthusiastic hobbyists. But you definitely make doing a Fox Talk Live next year, are you? I wouldn't say definitely. I haven't booked it yet. I've been thinking about it a lot, actually, lately, because there's talk about Og Camp possibly happening next year and stuff. And uh, it's it's kind of um, – I, I wait to see what happens with Og Camp and organize Foss Talk Live accordingly. Like, if Og Camp's going to be later in the year, then I try and do it earlier and, and stuff. And I've been thinking about maybe expanding it a little bit because the, the pub, the Harrison – Uh, it used to be open from five o'clock on a Saturday, but now it's open from uh twelve o'clock midday, I think. And so we could get in there earlier. We could do some other stuff as well. But then Stuart Langridge pointed out that if we start at twelve or one, then you know people are going to be knackered by the the end of it. People go to Oak Camp. Uh You know, I didn't this time because I was ill, but people go to Oak Camp, uh, go to the talks, and then they drink all night, and then they go to the talks back. So maybe it could, you know, if, you, if you're just saying from 12, to maybe 12, 12 noon to 2 a.m. at night, I think people would mostly be able to do that if it's on a Saturday. Yeah, I mean, it does mean getting up early. I mean, I have not seen that kind of time for a long oh, time right. since I've been working for Jupiter Broadcasting and Linux Academy because, you know, all my colleagues are in America and so it just makes sense for me to get on their time scale and, you know, time zone. So I, I don't know, that puts me off a little bit, but I could shift my routine a little bit and, and sort it out. But I, I don't know, maybe it would be fun to do some talks and, and uh, workshops or whatever during the day and then at six, seven o'clock or whatever, start doing the, the live shows. It, it's something I need to think a lot about, so I don't know. I don't know exactly what's going to happen this year, but I'll keep everyone posted. On that note, I think it's a probably a very good idea for us to wrap up. So thanks you again for uh, coming along, Joe. Um, very much appreciate it. Any socials or any places that you um, would like to plug for if anyone wants to ask you any questions from, from the community or whatever? Uh, yeah, so you can get me on Twitter at Joe Ressington. That's probably the best. Or oh, I'm in various Telegram groups. I'm in the Linux Lads one and uh, Late Night Linux and Jupiter Broadcasting. So if you, you want to get a hold of me, there's plenty of ways. Or uh, just go to joeress.com, J-O-E-R-E-S-S.com. You can find links there to Twitter and stuff. Um, but uh, I definitely have to plug work or I, uh, I'll get in trouble. <laughs> uh, not really, but uh, yeah, so Jupiter Broadcasting is, is what I do as my day job, and that's part of Linux Academy. Um, and I'm going to use your show to plug uh, our Black Friday sale. So you can get um, $150 off uh, right now, um, making it down to $299 if you go to learn.linuxacademy.com slash Jupiter. Sorry, I uh, had to get that plug in. Because, um, you know, Linux Academy makes all this possible, you know, all mm. my life possible, basically. Since the, the merger between Linux Academy and Jupyter Broadcasting, I've been able to go full-time as a podcaster, talking about Linux all the time. Um, in terms of shows, though, um, my favorite show, I think, of all the ones that I do, has got to be User Error, so error.show. Um, it's it's not even that Linuxy. We talk about Linux a little bit, but it's me, Popey, and Daniel Foray from Elementary OS, and um, it, we just talk about just whatever really, and just take the piss out of each other and, and stuff. It's uh, it's good fun. 
you just make such a perfect combination, the three of you, like, uh, you know, uh, Jan with his, like, he, he's such a, I mean, he comes across as such a proper California hipster with his uh, coffees yeah. and stuff. And then centrist Alan Pope, and then like you with your critical look outlook of uh, at, at things, and it just it it makes for uh, it's one of my most favorite shows on my podcast, really. Uh, yeah, for mine is mine as well. I was uh, listening to the latest episode and the whole the whole um, um, veganism and um, that whole thing. Like, it reminds me of a of a joke I think I made like several episodes ago, maybe. Uh, nine or ten episodes ago, I think it was when um when Tad was on talking about uh, OBS. It was the whole thing of if there's a vegan arch user, which which thing will they mention first? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, believe it or not, we have our own socials to plug. So if you want to support us, go to linuxlabs.com slash support. Any any donations are very much appreciated. If it's um, to buy us a coffee or help us um, contribute towards our costs, such as uh, hosting, uh, web hosting and so on and so forth. Um, if you want to catch up with us, we are on Telegram, which would be linuxlads.com slash Telegram, uh, Twitter at linuxlads, um, Facebook. Um, nah. <laughs> you, nah, you can pretty much ignore that one. Um, Mastodon. Or in a, email us show at linuxlads.com. Um, and all of these links will be on our webpage. So if you want a refresher of any of that information, it will all be on linuxlads.com slash uh, contact. Or um, I believe there's a contact button at the top. So um, we will wrap things up. I have been Connor. I've been Mike. And I've been Joe. And you stole that from late night Linux, you bastards. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys.